Thank you, ma'am. Weekly, yes, ma'am. Shall we start? Yes, ma'am. It's six zero five, ma'am. Yes. Okay. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of IEEE-CS, ACM, and the Computer Society of India, I am pleased to welcome Mr. John Davidas, who accepted our invitation to present webinar on economic platform enterprise architecture in the era of blockchain. Uh, we welcome you, sir. Thank you so much for accepting our uh, invitation. I also welcome all the participants who is here to uh, get the knowledge share, share from the speaker. I also happy to introduce our uh, today's speaker. Mr. John Devadas, he is is a founding director of Interwork Alliance and he serves on the governing board of the Global Blockchain Business Council. He builds blockchain developer, developer tools that are used by leading public and private ledger platforms. Earlier in his career at Microsoft, John incubated and built Microsoft Digital from zero to dollar 4.5 billion in revenue. He led the architecture product and developer enterprise for the .NET platform v1 and v2 and was instrumental in creating Microsoft's enterprise strategies. He is the board member of Global Blockchain Business Council. He is in the founder head development of NGD Enterprise in Incorporated. He was the general manager of Microsoft for more than 18 years at Redmond, USA. He has published many papers on blockchain and blockchain technology. And uh, we all 
uh, proud about him by seeing his LinkedIn profile. Once again, I welcome you, sir. Thanks for accepting our invite. Over to speaker. Th thank you very much, madam. Thank you for your very kind introduction. Uh, it is a privilege, truly a privilege to be here. And I want to thank you, uh, Sri Mohan and Dr. Akila, uh, in particular others, uh, for, for giving me this opportunity to discuss this particular topic that is very close uh, to my heart. Before I jump in, uh, uh, I would like to make it a discussion, please. So certainly, if you have questions, send it my way. Uh, in terms of a preamble, this particular topic of what I call economic platforms, enterprise architectures in the era of blockchain, really stems from me having spent close to 20 years in the enterprise software world, and then the last five years in the blockchain world. It is not that I know more than others on this call. It is just that I have had the privilege and the opportunity to have, if you might say, one leg in the enterprise world and one leg in the blockchain world. And so I'm able to see some parallels. And that's what I will present to you. I see this really uh, as an opportunity to discuss, maybe collaborate, partner. Uh, and if there are people on this call who want to follow up with me, uh, I would certainly very much uh, look forward to it. So with that, uh, let's jump in. Uh, on the next slide, I have a uh, a very small uh, table of contents. Uh, I will talk about architecture, give you a little bit of a historical context. Then uh, we will look back at enterprise architectures. You know, what exactly are enterprise architectures? Why do we care? And uh, how is this being applied broadly in the IT industry, especially in the enterprise space? And then of course, we'll segue into looking ahead at what I call the new economic architectures. And once again, why do we care? Why is this important in my opinion and uh, how I believe uh, this will be progressing in the coming years and certainly in the coming decades. So then on the next slide, uh, the first section in terms of uh, architecture uh, and, and give me a few minutes in, a, in the next slide I talk about what makes for good architecture? Uh, and I go back in history, you know, if you go back to the first century, uh, circa first century BC, uh, Vitruvius, who we all know uh, as the architect behind the Vitruvian man, uh, defined three attributes of what he termed good architecture. One is uh, durability, that it stands up robustly, and remains in good condition. Uh, utility, obviously that architectures, you know, should be useful and function well for the people that it is intended for. Uh, and last but not the least, very interestingly, uh, Vitruvius talks about the aesthetic dimension, that architecture should delight people and, and raise their spirits. And you might say, well, this is about architecture broadly, yes. Uh, but I certainly believe these principles apply to software architectures and especially enterprise architectures. The point on durability, you know, what you might call longevity is I'm sure very familiar to all of us who have spent time in the software world in terms of how we design systems and how we design architectures. On the next slide, you know, so we talked about what makes for good architecture. So if you go to the next slide, how do we know? How do we evaluate? And, and for me, this was a key question during my time in the enterprise world uh, when I was leading the architecture teams for .NET and for Azure. And I have here, obviously, as you can see, a picture of the Tanjavur Temple. And it's very much, you know, when we see good architecture, we know. It's very apparent to us. It's very obvious, right? And once again, if you look back in the context of Vitruvius's perspectives, we look at durability, you know, how long have we had the structure? We look at the function, the form of how it's serving. And certainly last but not the least, the aesthetic dimension, you know, of how elegant and how pleasing it is in terms of the form. 
So moving on to the next slide, what makes for good architecture? And I'll give you my perspective, and it is purely my perspective, and you're free to, you know, to obviously debate with me on this. Uh, I believe that the key is that it lasts. It evolves through time to endure, to function and delight. And this notion of evolvability is key because when we design systems, whether we do it intentionally or unintentionally, we're almost always designing systems for the future in terms of how will they change? How will they evolve? How will they you know, look like and behave in the next you know, three, five, 10 and, and so on years? So then in the next slide, you know, I, I, so, so far I've talked to you about what, is, what makes for good architecture. How, how, how do we know what is, what is good architecture? And I gave you a perspective, right, in terms of what I see in my experience as being a key lens in terms of how to look at architecture. Then you might say, okay, so this is all well and good. <laughs> it's good to talk about, you know, how, how do you define, how do you uh, envision good architecture, but what is architecture? And there are many, many different definitions, as you're very well aware. You know, we can go look at the Carnegie Mellon SEI. We can go look at the work done at various universities across the world in attempting to define what is software architecture. And I'll give you a very pragmatic perspective, very pragmatic perspective based on my own experience having designed, architected, and built systems. Uh, in my view, it is those decisions that you wish you could get right early on. And for people on the call familiar with uh, Fowler and his work during the early 2000s, this is probably very, very familiar to you, right? In retrospect, you know, we know exactly what these are, but looking forward, it's obviously not that easy to get these decisions right. And why is that? Because if you don't get them right early on, they could be very, very expensive later on in the cycle. And that's what makes or defines those critical decision points with respect to architecture. So again, you know, a very pragmatic definition, and I apologize for being, you know, so practical in terms of how we might look at it, but I want to give you my own experience of how, in a nutshell, I believe uh, what is software architecture. So then moving on to the second section, uh, I want to give you a little bit of a historical look back at enterprise architectures. Now, enterprise architectures have been around for a very long time. They've been around for decades, right? And so in the next slide, I talk about the need for enterprise architecture. Uh, and again, this is probably very familiar to all of you on the call, but I wanted to give you sort of set the, the context, if you will. What, why do we need enterprise architectures? The imperative and the challenge for enterprise architectures is because of the rapidly increasing IT budgets involved. And also that the success of the enterprise, you know, consumer, nonprofit, public sector, it doesn't matter. The success of this organization is now increasingly dependent on technology. And so this drove the need for a structured approach towards managing the growing complexity of IT applications and infrastructure. This, I believe, uh, is in a nutshell, the need for enterprise architecture. And again, those of you who are very familiar with this domain, this is probably not new to you, but I think it behooves us to set the context of why enterprises care about uh, enterprise software architectures. Then on the next slide, you know, we look at the field itself of enterprise architecture. And I think we could say it was in the late, mid to late eighties uh, when John Zachman at IBM really formalized the field of enterprise architecture with his seminal article, a framework for information systems architecture. And I'm sure you know, there's, a, there's a hyperlink there at your leisure, you can go take a look. In fact, if you have not, I would strongly recommend you take a look at it. It's a superbly written architect, uh, art article by Dr. Zachman. Uh, 
where he elegantly lays out the, the frame for how enterprises should think about uh, architectures across the organization. So we talked about the, the need, the imperative, right? The challenge for enterprise architectures. And then I give you the historical context in terms of when, you know, about 30 plus years ago, uh, you could say this field was really formalized for the very first time. Now, on the next slide, I talk, you know, briefly, and, and we'll delve into this in some detail in the next few slides, uh, very briefly about uh, what I think are the three dominant uh, approaches towards enterprise architecture. Perspective centric, and I'll discuss this again very briefly, process oriented, uh, and then what I call standards-based approach to enterprise architecture. Now, clearly there are many pros and cons. Uh, I wanna be very upfront. Uh, I, I'm not saying there is any one superior approach. Uh, that's not true. Each approach has obviously uh, advantages, uh, has disadvantages, uh, and different approaches might be relevant to different organizations based on technology as well as non-technology considerations. You know, culture, organizational values, for example, play, in my opinion, in my experience, a big role uh, in determining which approach may uh, or may not work for a certain organization. So moving on to the next slide, uh, the first one, perspective-centric approach. So this one, uh, I, I believe, is exemplified uh, by, again, John Zachman's framework for enterprise architectures. You could say, this is a, the framework, by the way, for EA. Uh, you could see it as a taxonomy. You could see it as an ontology. Now, in a nutshell, what it does is it surfaces diverse perspectives within and across the enterprise. And he essentially espouses this enterprise architecture as the blueprint for the organization and describes it from multiple vantage points, from the planner, from the designer, and so on. And why is this perspective centric? Because it satisfies the needs of multiple stakeholders and they're very distinct perspectives. And that's why I call this the perspective-centric approach to enterprise architecture. Now, moving on to the next slide, what you might call the process-oriented approach. The methodology that is typically reflects this particular approach is, uh, I think, the TOGAF, the Open Group Architecture Framework. It is realized as a very rigorous model of the imperatives structures, information processes of the enterprise for the purpose of decision-making. Now, why is this process-centric? Uh, but really because it attempts, it, it tries to portray the processes used uh, to model the, the enterprise. By the way, TOGAF, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, once again, would strongly recommend uh, you take a look at it. It's a very rigorous, very formal approach to enterprise architecture. Once again, with its uh, pros and cons. And of course, uh, the relevance you know, will differ based on the kind of organization that you're a part of. Moving on to the, the third approach in the next slide, which is what I call the standards-based approach. And, and the, the, the model, or, or I guess the, you could say the framework that really reflects this is the FEA, the Federal Enterprise Architecture. And in this approach, typically, it's about defining and enforcing the use of standards through the enterprise and across the enterprise. It typically highlights the need to define standards-based patterns and practices, i.e. reference models, common services, and so on. Uh, and also the communication of these artifacts across multiple stakeholders to ensure compliance, governance, or what you might call the alignment of, uh, of IT and business. So again, just a quick look back, we spoke about you know, the perspective-based, the processed, uh, and the process-based, as well as the standards-based approach. Just a quick look back at history. Now I wanna really delve into uh, the topic for this evening, uh, which is uh, what I call the new enterprise economic architectures. And again, the context I believe is necessary to see 
the evolution and the shift in terms of the landscape across architectures, enterprise architectures, and now these uh, new enterprise economic architectures. So in the next slide, and, and in this one, uh, let's pause for a few minutes, and I really want to open up as well for questions or discussion if there are any. I argue that the foresight, the vision, that business value can be realized by a holistic approach, a framework, if you will, whether it's the Zachman framework or TOGAF or FEA, has really shaped the IT industry for the last 30 plus years, 35, 40 years even. However, I also argue what is lacking and what has held IT back is the absence of any economic principles or thinking in all previous approaches to enterprise architectures. By this, what I mean is almost always enterprise architectures have looked at information. You know, we're familiar with the data architectures, technology architectures, infrastructure architectures, application architectures, right? Even business architecture, talking about the business. However, the enterprise is an economic institution and where our architectures have failed us, in my opinion, is this inability to map back to the economic incentives, the economic models, the economic architectures. Now you can say, John, you know, how do we know this, you know, this approaches have failed? You know, how, how can we, you know, tell me more about why you argue. And I'll tell you why. For those of us, those of you who have spent time in the enterprise software world, you're probably very familiar with this topic of aligning IT and business. And billions, maybe tens of billions of dollars have been spent on this, this topic, this notion of aligning IT and business. And almost always, you know, you have busloads of consultants, advisors, you know, contract uh, developers, people who come in and, and, and work with the organization to figure out how to map the business and IT back and forth. Now, why has this been an expensive, enormously expensive process? Is because the architectures themselves over the last 30, 40, 50 years have had no or very minimal relevance and backing to the economics of the institution. And this is why I argue that while these approaches have served us well over the last three, four decades, it is time to move on. An architecture that does not reflect the economic basis of the institution is no passe, is no legacy. So on the next slide, let me talk about blockchains. And of course, it's about 25 minutes into the, into the session. Uh, but now I want to tell you why I believe blockchain platforms herald uh, a new era, a new beginning, if you will. Uh, you know, I've spent at this point probably, uh, what, 35 years in the computing space. I went to, I went to college in Gindi. Uh, and in Gindi, I, I, I was working on mainframes and punch cards. And I spent time in the Valley working with client server, PC, SOA, web architectures, cloud architectures, and more. And in my experience, each of these waves of computing platforms, while extraordinarily powerful and impactful, have been passive computing stacks, passive inert computing stacks, in that I would argue they are mostly plumbing. They lay the, pli the pipes, the wiring, and the infrastructure. In every way, mainframe, client server, PC, SOA, web, cloud, web one, web two, whatever you want to call it. With blockchain platforms, however, for the very first time in the history of computing, we have a technology platform that has an innate, intrinsic economic model, the so-called crypto economic protocols. Never in the history of computing have we had economic protocols baked into the stack? Never. And this is what makes blockchain platforms distinctive, unique, and, and sometimes challenging to grasp. For those of us who come from the enterprise world, 
We are familiar with passive inert stacks, plumbing platforms. We are familiar with platforms that have no notion of economics or economic incentives. And so when we look at blockchain, I see two patterns in the enterprise world. I see a group of people who's, who tell me, John, look, I'm, I'm using blockchain platforms. I don't see anything here. What's the value? What's the big idea? And that's mostly because that group of people is using blockchain as a database, possibly a decentralized database, without really understanding the economic protocols, without exploiting the economic protocols, once again, baked into these systems. So not to flog the horse, but I want to reiterate, you know, having lived through and worked with multiple waves of technology platforms, I truly believe that we are at a very historic point in the history of computing. We have true economic platforms that we have never had in the history of computers. So the next slide, let me talk to you about then what I call the new economic architectures. I told you briefly earlier, you know, enterprises are economic institutions. And whether you go to, you know, economists like Coase or, or, or North, they talk about incentives and incentive models. It has been said that much, maybe most of economics can be summarized in one word, incentives. And the new enterprise economic architectures I'm proposing manifest this principle. In this incentive model approach, which are uniquely enabled by blockchain platforms, rewards, penalties. You know, colloquially, people call them tokens, right? So rewards, penalties, incentives, essentially, for each and every entity, human system, within and across the enterprise are endogenous meaning they are inside, intrinsic, baked in, and programmatically exercised via smart contracts. So once again, I want to emphasize this. The fact that in this world of blockchain platforms, aligning IT and business is not an overlay. Aligning IT and business is not something we think about later at the end of the cycle. It's not something we add on it's not something we try to figure out and say, how do I take this application or this system? And how do I make it align with my business goals? No more. No more because with blockchain platforms, we have these incentives baked in. We have these smart contracts that can create reward, penal penalize, and more. And so there is no overlay. And this is a critical piece that I, I want to again emphasize, right? There is no overlay. It's baked in. There is no adding aligning IT and business. You design the, uh, the smart contracts. And if you design them well, you know, intrinsically, you know, bingo, ergo, you have it. It's right there. And of course, if you don't design it, you don't have it. There is nothing you can add on later on. There is no need. And, and this, to me, is the, is the critical aspect around blockchain platforms that sometimes gets lost in all the noise around tokens and crypto and you know, policy and regulations and, you know, consumers and so on and so forth. But for us in this call, you know, I assume you are here because you care about the topic of architecture. And I want to emphasize, you know, ignore the noise. Just look at blockchain platforms as new economic computers, fundamentally different from every other wave of computing technologies that we've ever seen in the history of the industry. And look at how, you know, we, we are able to, to, to reshape, to really rethink how we architect these new economic uh, in architectures for the, for the enterprise, for the organization. And again, I could sp speak for a, for a long time on this particular topic, but, uh, but I want to just, you know, reiterate, right? The key to understanding, to thinking, in my opinion, in my, in my humble opinion, is that a new era of economic computing platforms which enable a first-class, intrinsic, in it, economic architecture that reflects the incentive models baked into every organization, public sector, nonprofit, private, it doesn't matter, right? That is what you could say is the magic of smart contracts and blockchain platforms. Now, are we there yet? No, I don't believe so. I think 
we are still as an industry trying to understand the place, the role and the value of blockchains. And as I said earlier, there is a lot of noise in this space. And so it gets uh, challenging. It's not so easy to parse it, to understand where and how we can map this truly, right? And I think there was a question about, you know, how, how do we map this into, into perhaps a, a use case, right? Uh, let me just take a couple of minutes here to just give you a, an example, uh, and then we'll come back towards the end for, for discussion. Uh, you look at the classic supply chain scenario. Supply chain is obviously, you know, vast domain, and especially recently through the lockdown and I know after, you know, we are seeing significant stresses and challenges on supply chains across the world, right? Uh, I'm currently based in Seattle. There's a very large coffee company based in Seattle that you're probably very familiar with. Uh, they source uh, coffee beans, uh, you know, from, from Colombia, from Tanzania, uh, from from uh, Ethiopia and, and certainly other parts of the world. As you can imagine, they have different grades of coffee beans. They obviously have different kinds of coffee. Uh, being able to source this, uh, there is an enormous percent of the IT budget that is spent on compliance and, and verification validation of the supply chain to ensure that, you know, if I tell you this is grade, you know, AAA coffee bean from Ethiopia, it is truly great AAA coffee bean from Ethiopia. How do we do this? Today, it's a very manual process. There's a lot of human, you know, Excel spreadsheets, you know, Word documents, uh, mapping, cross-checking, verification. But at the end of the day, as I was saying earlier, this is an overlay process. It's an overlay activity. It's not designed into these software systems. It cannot be. And so you have to figure out how to map this back into the existing software architectures. And, and what we are doing, working with, with an organization like this, uh, is to design the incentives into the supply chain via smart contracts. So what this means is, you know, at the beginning of the cycle, somebody may pl be playing games and, and take what is actually grade double A and call it grade triple A coffee beans. In the beginning, they might get away with it. But over time, as the system gets into equilibrium, the smart contracts, the incentive systems kick in and the provider or the, the co-op or the farmer who is not playing by the rules will see the penalties in terms of his rewards. And over time, as the system gets into equilibrium, the smart contract mechanism is able to jump in and provide the governance as opposed to human or, or consulting or other you know, extraneous overlay-based IT business alignment towards government. And we can talk more about this at the end and certainly follow on as well. But I want to emphasize this, right? This topic of aligning IT and business is a very old topic. It's a very expensive topic. Billions, tens of billions, maybe even more have been spent on it. And if you ask any CIO or any successful, have they achieved their, their goals, their outcomes with respect to aligning in business and IT? Almost always the answer is no. And yet they continue to spend even more billions on this. They don't have a choice. And what I argue is that blockchain platforms, economic computing platforms, provide a fundamentally different new approach to handling this intrinsically within the system. So moving on to the next slide. Uh, I'll give you a few key points in terms of how I see these economic architectures evolving. Uh, and then uh, depending on how much time we, we may have, we can certainly open up. Uh, the first one as a prerequisite is to model and build out a map of the enterprise. Now, of course, for those of you who are familiar with enterprise architectures, this is, this is old news. This is, this is nothing new, right? Of course. We have to model, we have to build a map. Now, if you're familiar with the Zachman framework, for instance, you, you, you know the old five Ws, the who, the what, the when, the where, and the why. But what has been missing, what has been missing for 30, 35 years is the for whom, right? Who benefits who, or, or maybe who has the most to lose, the incentives, for whom do the benefits ring up? And, and in retrospect, you might say, aha, it's, it's very simple. Yes, it is, of course, very simple. But the fact that for, for 30, 40 years, 
we've had these dimensions. We talk in great detail about the who, the what, the when, the where, and why, but we have not, we have not discussed, analyzed, and presented the for whom uh, is, I think, a critical piece because previous waves of computing platforms did not make it easy for us. Now, blockchain platforms make it very easy, very simple with smart contracts. The for whom can be programmatically baked in and designed. On the next slide, so second, now whether you use, uh, moving on to the next slide, if you would please. If you, whether, whether you use the perspective centric, the process oriented, or the standard space approach, I think we lost the slide, I think. Let me pause. Are you able to see the slides? Uh, no, no, John. All right, let me see if I can present, hang on. All right, I am having a constraint in terms of, uh, all right, let me, let me keep moving on and then we, we can certainly, you know, if we have the slides to come back, it's fine. So I spoke about firstly, you know, in terms of uh, as a prerequisite to model and build out the map of the enterprise, right? The old five W's, the who, the what, the when, the where, and the why need to be augmented with the for whom. The second one I want to talk about is, you know, whether you use the perspective centric or the process oriented or the standard space approach to enterprise architecture, you should, and I, and I say the word should very carefully, you know, should is a very strong word, but I want to emphasize it, should augment this with an incentive focused approach where you have the incentive model across the organization, across the enterprise designed into the underlying architecture via smart contracts. It's very early. And I realized that in terms of design patterns, in terms of how to apply this, how to approach this, how to programmatically map incentive models using smart contracts, it's very early in the game. I realized that. And that's what makes this fascinating because we can see where, you know, this trend is going. We can see what, what's, what's going to happen next. And therein lies the opportunity for us, for the people on this call, you know, in terms of if you believe in these notions, of how to take this forward. So once again, being able to design the economic model, the incentives in particular, via code, via smart contracts, into the, into the system, into the architecture. The third one, historically, and again, those of us who have spent time in the enterprise space, we know, we're familiar with the business architectures. You know, I spoke about the data architectures. Uh, oh, thank you. Thank you for the slide again. Uh, I'm in the next one, if you would, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, we have historically focused on, you know, business information, application technology, architectures, the so-called BIAT model. I'm sure it's very familiar with you, right? Uh, the, the perspectives in terms of uh, security architectures, right? Infrastructure architectures, operations architectures. But what has been missing and what has been lacking and this is a fundamental gap, is the economic architecture layer, one that reflects the theory of the business. And this enables the enterprise, the organization, to test, to validate, to verify, refine, and improve the business and operating model. Now, once again, I want to pause here because this is a very big leap. You know, as technologists, as architects, as developers, you know, program, program managers, uh, we are not familiar with the notion of mapping uh, the business model, the economic model into the software architectures. We are very comfortable taking requirements, mapping them into code. We are used to taking in requirements, use cases, and then codifying use cases. Now, what I'm proposing here is that with the advent of blockchains, I think we will need to challenge ourselves to really step back and say, it's not just about us writing the code or the software, right? Or designing the data or the information or the application architecture. It is truly about mapping out the e economic architecture. It's a fundamental leap, I, I, I realize, right? It's a substantial shift in terms of mindset. And this, by the way, 
is also why I believe uh, blockchain adoption in the enterprise in particular is still lagging. Because the mindset shift required here is, is quite substantial. You know, moving away from seeing ourselves as taking requirements to flipping it to, to designing the business model, to designing the incentive model into the, into the architecture. Fundamental shift. So in the next slide, um, you know, in summary, I want to say, the new enterprise economic architectures, I argue, and again, this is my humble opinion, the, the new economic architectures enabled by blockchain platforms will transform enterprise IT architectures into strategic toolboxes. And I also argue that blockchains will be how your enterprise gets there. I have a link uh, at the, in this slide, and I'm happy to share the link on, on uh, Google Meet as well. It's an article I wrote on this topic probably about a year and a half ago, uh, and it gives you a little bit more context and history beyond the slide deck here. So if there is interest, there is, uh, uh, you can certainly look it up. Uh, so in, in, in terms of wrapping up, I want to just summarize. You know, we can see blockchain platforms as being, how do I say it, dominated by the consumer perspective, tokens, crypto, uh, policy, regulation, um, you know, unicorns, so on and so forth. But really, I think uh, for us technologists, architects, it, this is a new computing platform. It's a new computing wave of truly economic computers, the likes of which we have not seen before. And that's what makes it challenging, perhaps difficult, not so easy to grasp and to manage. But I think if we make that leap and then the corollary very quickly becomes that architectures have to be economic architectures. And that is my thesis here in this uh, very short talk. Uh, and hopefully it's given you a perspective, uh, whether you agree with me or whether you disagree with me, hopefully uh, it at least gives you another perspective to look at this rapidly changing space. And I certainly uh, welcome discussion and questions. With that, once again, I wanna thank uh, Sri Mohan. In a, early on, he reached out to me, uh, and uh, he was uh, very influential in, in, in the early discussions to help me to think through this. I want to thank Dr. Akila and, of course, uh, the team at CSI and IEEE for giving me this opportunity. Truly a privilege. Uh, always a, a pleasure to discuss this topic. So my email is on the slide. Feel free, please, you know, to send me questions, uh, whether you like it or not. If you like it, you know, let me know. Uh, if you have questions, if you want to debate, please let me know as well. Uh, with that, let me pause and uh, give it back to the team. Thank you. Thank you very much for your wonderful presentation, sir. So we have received uh, some of the questions during your registration process. I will read out one by one and uh, you can give the answer. One of the registered participants asked you to uh, share the understanding of typical AISIS enterprise architecture. Uh, I'm sorry, could, could, could you say the uh, question again? Sorry, I lost it, please. Uh, please share the understanding of typical AISIS enterprise architecture. Yes, yes, the as is, yes, yes, yes. Uh, you, you're right. I mean, classical, traditional enterprise architectures, you know, posit the as is and the to be. And of course, that's how we create the gap analysis and the map of, uh, you know, from where we are to where, where we want to be as an organization. Uh, and once again, if I understand the question. Uh, is that relevant? Yes, the as is, is still very much relevant. I'm not proposing a replacement of the existing frameworks or taxonomies or approaches. What I'm proposing is to augment and enhance the existing approaches with the economic dimension, the economic perspective, the economic layer, uh, if that uh, answers the question. Okay. Thank you, sir. The next question is, what are the standards, policies, acts of Blockchain transactions. Uh, it's a really good question. <laughs> it's a very good question. Uh, in fact, this is one of the things that we've been doing. You know, I, I'm a co-founder of the Interwork Alliance. We are working on open standards protocols for blockchain platforms uh, at a global scale uh, on the Global Blockchain Business Council. Uh, if there is interest, in fact, what I would recommend is, uh, for instance, the token taxonomy framework is one of the key 
uh, areas of research that we have done. We have published uh, version one of the token taxonomy framework. It provides an ontology to be able to, to describe, define, and then eventually map tokens onto smart contracts across a variety of blockchain platforms. In fact, not just blockchain platforms, but even uh, non-blockchain, even database uh, systems. So uh, the TTF is certainly one area I would I would uh, recommend to take a look at. Now, beyond the token taxonomy framework, we're also working in terms of uh, the application layer, what you might call the smart contract layer, and, and the standards therein in terms of interoperability, coexistence, and sharing across multiple blockchain uh, systems and architectures. That's probably the one area where I would recommend to take a look at. With that said, the space is still, in my opinion, very early. It's still emergent. I don't think we have seen mainstream uh, acknowledgement, I would say is the word, in terms of these economic architectures. I hope to see it you know, over the next three to five years, uh, but it's still very early. So there is opportunity for us, for those on the call, I think, to contribute certainly uh, if they see merit in this approach, uh, and to certainly uh, innovate. Thank you, sir. We'll move to the next question. What is the framework needed to develop EA, economic architecture? Yes, that's a very good question. <laughs> um, you know, we, we discussed the, the, the uh, perspective-oriented, the process-centric, the standards-based. Uh, my experience, you know, 25 plus years of working with enterprise organizations and architectures. My, my experience is that uh, the framework or the methodology, and again, I say it uh, in my humble opinion, uh, is secondary to how we apply the framework or the methodology. Uh, frankly, you know, any of these FEA, TOGAF, you know, the Zachman framework, they're probably good enough for the most part. It's how we apply them that actually I think makes the big difference. The application, uh, is a reflection of the culture, the va the values of the organization, and also how amenable the organization is itself, you know, how receptive they are to the framework. So I would say choose a framework based perhaps less in terms of the technology requirements or technology constraints, and rather more based on the culture and the values and, uh, you know, the principles that, that, that drive the organization, because that will determine whether the enterprise architecture will endure, will survive, and will last, in, in my opinion. Thank you, sir. The next question is, is blockchain technology a threat to centralized banking system? Ah, thank you, sir. That's the, that's the really good question. It's a profound question. Uh, I will tell you, based on where I am with the Global Blockchain Business Council, um, I was at the World Economic Forum in Davos in May earlier this year, close to 90% of central banks worldwide, and almost 90% of central banks worldwide are using blockchain technology in some fashion or the other towards the central bank digital currency. So I think uh, from their perspective, they don't see it as competition. In fact, they seem to see it as very useful technology to help them to achieve their goals. Uh, the media might say otherwise, but the reality, I think, uh, is quite different. Thank you, sir. The next question is, what are the basics of design and development of uh, blockchain applications? Yes, that's a, that's a very good question. Thank you. <laughs> um, we, there, there are two perspectives, I would say, and again, based on my experience, right? I see organizations treating blockchain uh, platforms really mostly as databases, uh, at best decentralized databases. And in that case, the design patterns from SOA, you know, from distributed systems, uh, certainly are very applicable, loosely coupled architectures, right? Fundamentally, you know, this goes back to loosely coupled systems, loosely coupled, uh, you know, applications and services, composability, how do we design uh, multiple services to cooperate, to work together. That's the basis. Now, with that said, if that's all we see, then we miss the true value, I think, of blockchain platforms, which is the economic incentives, the economic models. And therein, to answer the question, very early, very emergent, uh, I, I don't think we can say that we truly understand the design patterns yet. 
There is going to be a book written on design, economic design patterns. That book is not out there yet. And maybe, you know, somebody, one of us on this call might be, might be writing it later. But I would say, excellent question. Uh, but this is like, you know, circa, let's say, mid-90s before the C++ design patterns book was published, right? We knew, we could see. We had early ideas of these design patterns and we knew what a singleton was and we knew what the MVC was, but it wasn't codified. I see it very similarly. We can see the early patterns, but uh, they are yet to be codified uh, is how I would say it. Thank you, sir. The next question is another interesting one. How to sustain future in blockchain technology as a computer science engineer? That's a very good question. A very good question. Thank you for asking, sir. Uh, uh, I, I will share what I what I share with uh, uh, with people that I mentor, uh, especially students uh, in colleges. Uh, and again, this is a very biased uh, uh, opinion. Please take it as a, as a, as purely as an opinion. Please, uh, I strongly recommend anybody who's obviously entering the space in college or probably early on in their career uh, to try to take. Uh, a class or a course in uh, economics to understand uh, economic models, incentive models, because I certainly believe, based on you know the slides you saw over the last forty-five minutes, I believe that understanding of uh, economic models will distinguish the architects and developers of tomorrow with respect to realizing this goal of aligning IT and business, and those you know, who focus purely on the software side, on the technology side, you know, will not be able to make that leap or cross that bridge. Once again, in my very humble opinion, so I would say, you know, a minor in economics or certainly, you know, time uh, taking a class, class a course, understanding really, I think uh, the history, the, the models, the incentives, the basis, and how we might map them onto code. Uh, and, and why do I say this? Uh, you know, you look at Bitcoin, right? And, and is, is Bitcoin an application? It's hard to call it an application, right? It runs by itself. Nobody's starting it. Nobody's stopping it. You know, is there somebody, you know, who shuts it down? No. Is there somebody who says, look, I'm going to start the service? No. I argue Bitcoin is an institution. It's not an application. It's an institution. And if the developers of tomorrow have to build institutions, then we have to understand the economics of institutions. And that's why, you know, I give you my answer. Of course, uh, like I said, it's a, an opinion. <laughs> Please take it for what it's worth. Thank you, sir. Next question is also an interesting question. What are the drawbacks of blockchain? Ah, so that's a really good question. <laughs> um, I'll give you again uh, my opinion, sir. <clears throat> and again, please take it as an opinion. Uh, as somebody who sees the long-term potential and the benefit of blockchain platforms to create socioeconomic change, to drive socioeconomic change, uh, I see the potential. Now, I think, and this is again my opinion, a platform based purely on economic incentives, purely on economic incentives, whilst a huge leap across all previous waves of computing does not really reflect the real world. Because in the real world, people, humanity, you know, the incentives that we work with are not purely economic. We have altruistic incentives. We have social incentives. And so in my opinion, this is a huge leap, significant leap, to be able to have economic models incentives baked into the computing platforms. However, if we see it as this is the end goal or the end game, I think we run the risk of forgetting that incentives in the real world go well beyond economic incentives. And that's what I would say I see as the drawback. And I believe this is something in the next three, five, seven years, we will see the next wave of blockchain platforms that go well beyond economic incentives. Thank you, sir. And last question, what are the open source technologies used in blockchain? It's a very good question. I would say, you know, there's, there's probably a very broad surface area, sir, in terms of we could talk about a whole variety of open source protocols, IP code bases. 
But I think uh, you know, there's one I would pick on. Obviously, it's the uh, you know it's cryptography. Yeah, I mean, much of the progress around uh, is is due to the fact that we are building on the shoulders of giants, giants who have uh, innovated and pioneered much of the cryptographic uh, basis that provides the foundation for for blockchain tech. The fact that you know we're able to have these systems. Uh, in a secure fashion to operate, to cooperate, you know, to come together to achieve these business goals, the outcomes uh, is would not be possible without uh, the foundation of crypto cryptography. So I would say that's the one space. And again, it's a space that I strongly recommend if people have not had a chance, you know, it is truly fascinating, the progress in terms of cryptography. It, it, it is incredible, you know, the leaps and bounds that the industry has made over the last, you know, five, seven years especially in areas like, for example, zero knowledge proofs and zero knowledge. Uh, amazing, amazing work going on. So I would say that's the one area. Of course, there are many, many other areas in terms of open source IP, open source protocols. But personally, you know, I'm probably biased towards the, the, the cryptography aspect. Uh, with that said, I think we're going to see more and more in terms of the economic incentives and models with respect to open source IP. We're seeing the very early aspects around things like, for example, DAOs, right? Decentralized autonomous organizations, you know. So there we're seeing the early, early stages of how to bake in these incentives. You know, the people ask me, you know, where, where are we in this particular evolution, this particular wave? And there's an analogy I use, you know, I tell people, you know, imagine you're sitting in a movie theater and you're watching a trailer. And, and where we are right now with respect to blockchain is uh, we are watching the trailer. The movie is a long way off, right? It's very early in this game. And so I see plenty of opportunity, uh, plenty of, uh, you know, avenues for, for innovation. So again, sorry, a, long, a very long answer to your question, but uh, I guess the short answer is cryptography. So few questions we have received during this chat. So I will read out one by one. Yes, so, sir. Blockchain technology is hailed as a boon, boon technology. And the cryptography is viewed as a ban. Why so? It's a, it's a very good question. Uh, and uh, I think it goes back to the fundamentals in terms of perhaps uh, how policymakers think or understand this space. Now, with, with all due respect, uh, you know, obviously I don't want to speak for policymakers and regulators in terms of how they see it. Uh, but I believe, and again, I'm giving you my, my interpretation, is that consistently, globally, across the world, policymakers, regulators see the potential of this new computing platform. They see the possibilities. For example, you know, we spoke about CBDCs, central bank digital currencies. They all will be built on a fabric of blockchain technology. That's a fact. There's probably no other way of doing it. However, on the flip side, when they see a proliferation of consumer, what you might call cryptocurrencies, uh, clearly there is concern, angst, uh, and of course, you know, we can imagine from a control perspective, uh, the risk or the perception of losing control, I think is where you have this dichotomy of, uh, of views with respect to policy makers. Thank you, sir. The next question is, is there any option for graduating students to focus on any learnings from this topic that would help them choose a career in blockchain? That's, that's, a, that's a very profound question, sir. So, <laughs> It's a, it's, a, it's a deep question. I want to be careful in terms of how I answer. I would say what I'm proposing here is how I see the domain of architecture evolving, shifting, because I'm able to see on one side the enterprise world of software and on the other side the world of blockchains. And I'm able to bring those together because I have a unique privilege of spending time on both domains. I would say in terms of perhaps students or, or uh, you know young people looking at this in from a from a newer dimension I would say be skeptical have an open mind look at these not as you know an evolution but look at blockchain platforms truly as a revolution because there has not been a platform like this in the history of computers and from that perspective whatever you take from it I think would be up to you in terms of how you want to apply it. You can come back and say, actually, you know what? It's just a database. Totally fine, <laughs> right? But I would say, you know, blend in uh, 
technology and economics. And I think that's going to be the key for success uh, is being able to harness uh, economic ideas and technology ideas. The time of being able to say I'm a software person and I work purely on software, I think is over. Thank you, sir. The next question is, how does the adoption of blockchain in enterprises and be any recommendation on how not to do? Yes, thank you. A very good question. Thank you for asking. Uh, I'll give you a very brief answer. I think if we see it as a ledger or a database, at best, a decentralized database, then I would say, why even bother? You don't need it. You, can, you might as well use a centralized database. And that's why I see many pilots, POCs, kind of stagnating and stuck. On the other hand, if you see blockchains as economic platforms, if you're truly able to design your architectures to use smart contracts to embed economic incentives, then yes you will see enormous benefit. But otherwise, you're going to spend a lot of money just on a glorified database. And that, I think, is probably of no value, right? Thank you, sir. What tech stack and tools should your developers use? Thank you for, for the, that's, that's a really good question. Uh, not, not to give you a, an opinion. Uh, I would say, at this point, if the goal is to get familiar, to learn, to acclimatize, uh, it could be any stack. It could be any blockchain. It could be you know any ledger. Uh, as long as you're able to understand the principles, you know the the thinking behind it, the implementation, the application. You know, it's like saying which language should I use? You know, should I use C sharp or Java or JavaScript? Frankly, I think that's probably a secondary question in my humble opinion. I think the primary question is. How do I think about writing code? How do I think about designing software? And how I realize it, I would say, is a secondary aspect. So do, do not be perhaps misled by people who say this chain or this stack or this blockchain you know, is superior or inferior. Frankly, it doesn't matter. As long as you understand the concepts, then you will be well informed to make your own decision as to which stack is better from your perspective, I think. Thank you, sir. The next question is, how can the IT professionals address the skepticism about cryptocurrency? <laughs> Thank you. So that's a good question. <laughs> how do I say it? Uh, cryptocurrencies, obviously, you know, as we discussed briefly, may be seen by central bankers as competition. And I know in some cases it is certainly seen as competition. Uh, from an IT perspective, I would argue that we are better off perhaps staying away from the topic of cryptocurrencies and instead focus on how crypto economic protocols can benefit enterprises, right? The basis of cryptocurrencies is crypto economic protocols. So I would say ignore the currency aspect. That's noise. It's in the media. It's a lot of confusion, perhaps. You know, it's a lot of uh, strong opinions. But the crypto economic protocols are of enormous potential and value to enterprises. And that's kind of in some ways the, the, the core thesis of my slide deck is that we are yet to see the benefit of these crypto economic protocols. So I would say from an IT perspective, my humble opinion is stay away from cryptocurrencies, focus on crypto economic protocols. Thank you, sir. On last question. Yes, sir. Will blockchain take a direction like artificial intelligence in 1990 there are lots of papers, but no implementation due to <laughs> the value. <laughs> That's a very good question. <laughs> and I can empathize with the question because uh, I spent many years in the 90s in graduate school working on AI. And I came away very disillusioned with AI. <laughs> and so I can, I can certainly empathize with the question. Um, I think... And, and because I've spent time in both the domains, um, firstly, I think uh, we ought to see machine learning really as an applied science. It's, in my opinion, statistics perhaps glorified. And from that perspective, there has been enormous benefit, I would argue, from AI. Enormous, significant benefit in terms of applying statistics to very large data sets. So the 
the vision that was sold and what led me to spend six years in graduate school was the idea that we could create <laughs> intelligent computers, whatever that means. And obviously, you know, I, I believe we have failed. I don't think we can ever achieve that goal, in my humble opinion. Similarly, with respect to blockchain, I think, and this is my opinion, that the the aura, uh, the the media buzz around cryptocurrencies, uh, I believe, uh, will fade away, and probably for good reason. But the same way that machine learning has endured to create value, uh, blockchains will endure to create value as long as we understand that, you know, there is no silver bullet, right? This is not as, I, I don't want to argue that blockchains are a silver bullet. There has never been a silver bullet in the history of computing. We all know that. But what I'm proposing, what I am arguing very passionately for is that this is a new kind of computing platform. And that's all. It's a new kind of computing platform, but fundamentally different because you have economics inside. And how we use it, I think, is entirely up to us. And it could take a long time, possibly. Thank, thank you very much, sir. These are the, some of the questions we have received. Now we will move to the formal vote of thanks. So on behalf of the Computer Society of India Chennai chapter, IEEE Computer Society Madras chapter, and the ACM Chennai professional chapter, I would like to thank today's speaker and resource person, Mr. Mr. John Tevadas, board member, Global Blockchain Business Council and founder, uh, Redmond USA, for his uh, interesting and uh, very interactive uh, lecture on economic platforms, enterprises, architectures in the era of blockchain. We had a large number of questions and uh, he has answered all the questions. And uh, on behalf of all the societies, uh, uh, I would like to thank uh, Mr. John Tevadas. I will also thank uh, Mr. H.R. Mohan, uh, Chairman, Special Events, IEEE Computer Society, Chennai, chap Chennai Chapter, and uh, Mr. T.V. Kamalakannan, Chairman, Computer Society of India, Chennai Chapter, and uh, Dr. TV, Mr. T.V. Subramaniam, Past Chairman, uh, Computer Society of India, Chennai Chapter, and uh, Dr. Aguila, um, uh, Secretary, is in Computer Society of India, Chennai chapter, and all the office bearers of the Computer Society of India, IEEE Computer Society, and the ACM Chennai professional chapter for their support in organizing this webinar. I also thank all the participants who have joined through this Google Meet and through YouTube channel and asked many questions during their registration process. Thank you, Anandal. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I want to again appreciate, you know, Dr. Akila, Sri Mohan and the others for giving me this opportunity. I hope it was of some value and I certainly look forward to following up on email. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, so now we can wind up. Madam, recording stop on hearing. Stop, sir. <laughs>